Come on, silly boy. There we go. Come on. Up. Come on. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Boy, Minky. 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 There's Minky. Hi, silly boy. Hi, silly boy. You're okay. You're okay, Minky. 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 You're okay. You're okay. You're okay. Oh, I'm gonna get in and don't call me crazy, but I'm going to uh, do the trip with him in the front seat. Alrighty. It'll be a bit of a risk. Hi, Minky. Hi, silly boy. Hi, silly boy. Hi, silly boy. Hi, silly boy. Hi, Minky. Good boy. You're okay, silly boy. Oh, silly boy. Hi, silly boy. Close the door. There we go. He's covered over that. He's very reactive. Minky, 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 Minky. Hi, silly boy. Minky, Minky, Minky. There's Minky. Good boy, you're okay. You're okay. You're okay. You're okay. You're okay, silly boy. There you go. No, no, you're... Minky, Minky, Minky. Hi, silly boy. Minky, you're okay. 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 Walter, no. No, Walter. No, Walter. Okay, Minky, on the bed. Good boy, Minky. Good job, silly boy. Good boy. Let's take that off. Where Minky is, Minky decided to come up and say hi. Hi, Minky. Hi, silly boy. You're okay. You're okay, silly boy. Okay, so with me today, I have James Tsai of Arf Arf Bark Bark Foundation in Vancouver. Uh, James has over 1,400 days and almost 20,000 hours working along primarily with extremely dangerous giant dogs. Recognized by the Court of New York to successfully rehabilitate the most extremely dangerous Great Dane, attacked 16 people in North America in 2016-2017. VID, proprietary science-based psychogenesis evaluative dog training, repeatedly and successfully rehabilitates mildly dysfunctional seven-pound dogs up to extremely dangerous dogs weighing over 150 pounds that have developed predatorial behavior due to extreme human abuse, V10 scale. So I, I think a lot of people in dog training would know what V10 means. I'm assuming it's the most dangerous type of dogs out there. Um, it's, not, it's, it's something that I have created on my own scale of that, and because the existing scale, which is done by uh, Dr. Ian Dunbar, who's heavily relied upon through various accreditation uh, facilities, um, he's created a scale which is based on the fact of the dog's reactivity. If a dog attacks somebody, bites somebody, then mm -hmm. this bite level scale is from bite level four, which is to somewhat break the skin. Bite level six is where you're actually breaking the skin and causing some lacerations. Bite level six is where you, where the dog has killed someone or another animal. Right. So, 
what 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 happens is on that particular scale it's a bit archaic because it is not based on the actual psychology of the dog's behavior it is based on the resultant aspects of the dog's behavior so it, it is a rhetorical scale it's basically saying well the dog bit someone so now the dog is at level five oh, whereas my my skill works on the actual psychology of the dog's behavior and the viciousness and the, the, the dysfunctions that the dog has. And then my skill goes above six because six is, is literally any dog that will kill someone or another animal. Right. So it's a no-brainer there. Uh, bite level seven, eight, nine, and ten deals with the frequency of bites and attacks on other people or animals. And for example, bite level ten. Bite level ten would be a dog that has attacked upwards of 12 people at a minimum with the attempt to wow. kill uh, one or more people. So that's where my scale is. It is an arbitrary scale that I um, develop, but it is based on real life versus the other aspects where it is on theoreticals and rhetorical. Well, that's uh, very interesting, but um, I, I, first of all, welcome to the show, James. <laughs> I'm so sorry, where are my manners? Um, so basically, we're going to talk about the work you do, which is fascinating. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of you, especially um, that uh, the court of new york recognizing you that way like that was in 2016 2017 uh what yeah. happened they asked you to come in and uh deal with a dog that had uh, been known to bite a lot of people i guess yeah so there's a dog that's in the media it's quite uh, quite a well-known dog that had about 300,000 people see his posts and so forth on facebook and more mm -hmm. so uh, his name is Tonka, and it's Great Dane. He's about 183 pounds. He is 38 inches at the withers, a standing height of over 6 feet 4 inches tall. Oh uh, my this God. Is, <laughs> yeah, this is a dog that is bigger, heavier, and taller, longer than an, an adult wolf. And wow. in a short time frame of 19 months at the shelter in South Hamptons, which is quite an affluent shelter out there in New York, right. he attacked a total of 16 people, having gone through seven different homes. Uh, six of those homes were, uh, unfortunately, he was severely abused, snared, starved, shop collared. Um, one owner was seen when he was returning uh, Tonka back to the shelter, dragging him back when he was about eight, nine months of age, and pounding him heavily in the head, which is what they suspect is causing 20% blindness, 10% hearing loss, and some slight brain damage, which by all accounts, according to, you know, existing, you know, archaic scale system, he would already have been dead. Uh, he has dragged a shelter worker into his kennel, causing wounds uh, requiring 42 stitches. He's attacked a child in the face who got close to his food when his parents uh, admitted responsibility, but he got close to that child required plastic surgery. Uh, he's put other people in the hospital from his attacks. And so what ended up happening is uh, a number of Great Dane groups heard about me. Well, they knew about me anyway, right? So they contacted me, and a lot of people said, could you please help? And I said, yeah. Of course, and it's a pro bono aspect because when it comes to dogs that are that dangerous, it's just something that I'm going to do. Um, so what ended up happening is over a hundred people, sorry, uh, over a hundred people wrote letters to uh, the court of New York asking that he be sent to me. And um, he also had a uh, retired NYPD, C uh, sorry, he had a retired NYPD officer. Right. So an ex-army vet who had worked with him for over a year, and she also worked towards having him sent to me as well. Wow. So the court then ordered him. They gave him actually a kill order, which was his third kill order, and he's not allowed back in the state of New York, is what they said. And then he was sent to me to uh, Seattle, and in Seattle he got uh, away from us. <laughs> Someone wants your attention, I think. <laughs> he's fine. got it, squirrels. Hopefully he can edit this out. Anthony, um, so what ended up happening is um, when, he got to, when he got to Seattle, he, um, he we went to his hotel. I'm sorry, just give me a second here. Is that okay? Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Anthony, stop, please. Um, so what ended up, thank you. Um, so what ended up happening, <laughs> we went to the hotel room, um, and it, what essentially happened is, he got away from his handler in the hotel room while he was on leash, and he he cornered me in the hotel room. Uh, he grabbed me, and he ragdolled me a bit. And it is quite a significant situation to be grabbed by a dog. Yeah, that, that uh, size. Extremely big, and they have over 700 PSI bite strength, and he can pick up a 100-pound weight. So <laughs> it, it, it's quite frightening, and, and it hurt quite a bit. But, again, um, this is what my work is uh, centered on. So it didn't phase you. <laughs> it scared the heck out of me. <laughs> well, of course. 
at the I time, was, but you're, you've gotten used to it, I guess. Uh, you <laughs> not not you really. Used to it. <laughs> you know, I, I had to drive him back from Seattle to Vancouver, and he was in the back of my truck. And his handler, like I said, who had been working with him for over a year and, yeah. and was very calm with him, he actually attacked her through his muzzle and bit two of her fingers. Uh, she's an ex-army vet, right? And she's like 5'10". Wow, she's girl. a tough girl. So he attacked her, and then I had to bring him back to north, uh, north to to my home in Vancouver, and then spend you know months with him. So it's extremely frightening, absolutely, absolutely. frightening. Uh, and it took you how long to rehabilitate him? Uh, it depends on the stages of where we were trying to go. So, uh, for example, when he was in New York, the head trainer of six city shelters, including the Southampton Animal Shelter, uh, she went to work with him, and she had two people as uh, safety backup outside and she lasts about 40 minutes and she said there's no way we're going to train him. Um, mm. The Southampton Animal Shelter, they called around North America for four months trying to find someone, any behaviors or trainer, and we're talking the master dog trainers, we're talking internationally known behaviors. Uh, they all turned him down saying that he would either kill them or one of their staff members. So to get him off leash and so forth, I was able to do that in about four days. No way. That's yeah, crazy. So yeah, and, and you know, it's just reading the aspects of the psychogenetic uh, markers of the dog, the psychology of the dog, and the behavior of the dog, and understanding that the dog is reacting at one tenth of a second. So I was able to do that. And then there's other aspects of trust that need to be established with the dog because they're based on a psychological profile, a rudimentary basis of um, appreciation of emotional and logical processing. So uh, to be able to address that in an organic fashion as well, when I'm not being cornered by yes. him, <laughs> yeah, it's one. <laughs> It's one thing when you have a small 50-pound dog trying to attack you. It's another thing when you have a, a, a dog that is this significant and he comes up to my chest, Yeah. just stands there in front of you waiting for me to move. Absolutely. And the fact that he's been abused all his life, you know, doesn't help, right? Like he, he's built up a certain protection, right? Like it's defensive mechanism. Okay. Bye. So I know like uh, we spent a bit of time, uh, more time than I thought, but um. It's, it's sure. fascinating work, and I'm sure everyone listening is interested as well. Uh, but before we, obviously the podcast is about the dog cat me trade in Asia, and you um, started a petition in Canada to adopt the same uh, resolution that they voted in uh, the States in 2018. So that is the dog cat meat uh, prohibition act of 2018, it's HR Resolution uh, 6720, I believe. And so we're trying to get the same law passed here in Canada, and you've been instrumental. I mean, you're the one who started the petition, and um, many people have supported it. At this point, we're above 100,000. And so we're gonna talk about that later on on the show. But before, I would love to delve a little bit more into um, your upbringing and give a, the viewers a little bit of a personal note on you. Uh, for example, where were you born and raised? And did you always love animals? Did you always have this snack with dogs and growing up? What was it like growing up? So um, I'm one out of eight children in my family. So it's a very large family. And I'm number six in the lineage of it. Ooh. And there's four boys and four girls in the family. I am the first child born out of China. So my parents moved to Vancouver in the mid 60s, uh, subsequently moving over to Victoria. So I grew up there. Um, I was definitely afraid of dogs. Oh, Absolutely yes. Your 100%. parents uh, taught you to be afraid of dogs or? I just happened to be afraid of dogs. And um, what happened is when I was in, I think I was like six years old in grade one, and we were having PE outside, uh, physical ed outside gym yeah. class. And uh, I was, we were running around the track, and German Shepherd, I recall I said German oh. Shepherd because I was quite traumatized by that. Uh, he started chasing me, and because I didn't know anything about dogs, I thought he was going to kill me. Yeah, they're so big I, dogs. He, especially when you're, you know, this tall. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so I kept running and running, and the teacher was telling me and yelling at me to stop. And as I kept running, the dogs kept chasing me. And I got more and more scared, and I started crying and panicking, and everyone's telling me to stop running. And I finally got caught by my, my teacher. Like, I finally stopped, and the dog's yeah. around me. The teacher's got me, and I'm crying my head off, and I'm thinking the dog is going to kill me, literally kill yeah. me. <laughs> and she, she explains, no, actually, he thought you were playing with him by running. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. You know, I had fun. Yeah. So, so for 
for till till probably my late teens, early twenties, deathly afraid of dogs. Absolutely, wow. like when and I went to think that what you do today, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's kind of like what Bruce Lee did with martial arts. So I want to kind of change oh. the world of dog by by going for my there fear. There you go. You're the Bruce Lee of dog training. <laughs> so, hope so. Um, so you say your parents um, obviously come from China. What part of China? Uh, they were from Borneo, and so they are actually speaking uh, from Fujian. So they they speak Fujiao. Um, so my dad Which was I there. I heard of. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I'm probably, you know, murdering the the enunciation of it. But um, uh, so we grew up there in Victoria, and my parents, um, like I say, my dad had been a professor in China. And uh, unfortunately, during those times of communism, uh, he was quite afraid, just because he felt that being an educated person was quite detrimental, and he knew colleagues um, that had um, issues, and so he decided to leave and move to Vancouver. Can you expand a little bit more about that? Because for some of us, we don't understand, you know, a communist regime. I mean, I was, I lived here my whole life. Many people at home probably don't understand as well. Being educated at the time in China, what could have happened to him? Like he he would have been considered a threat, I suppose. Yeah, he would have lost any of any property that he had. He actually had a, a plantation with about five thousand acres there. So he was concerned for a couple of things. Um, one is losing his property, and the other thing was being killed. In fact, my father was so afraid that he, him, and my mom, uh, who passed away, they never returned back to China. Wow! Even that, that even is serious, you know. Yeah, it, it's really unfortunate. Even though um, my uncles had gone back to China and so forth, so for some reason, my father um, felt he couldn't go back, and they never spoke about it. And is it like that today? Like, as far as you know, like through your relatives, maybe you have some uncles that are back in China, or. <laughs> My uncles have passed away, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. But from what I understand, my older brother has gone back, and my younger brother and some other uh, siblings. There's no issues. They've never had any issues going okay. back to China. So it was a my, time and place, I suppose. Yeah, my my dad was, I guess, well, rightly so, paranoid because he did not want to uh, risk it. Of course, of course. Um, so your parents, not like I guess in China, uh, having pets is not a popular thing. It's only more in recent years that people are allowed to have pets in certain parts of China. Um, so I guess you're, you didn't develop your love for animals, and actually you said that you know you were definitely afraid of dogs, and to, up until your mid twenties, you say or. Yeah, until about my mid twenties when I started feeling a bit more comfortable by meeting other friends' dogs. Um, then I realized that they weren't going to try to bite me in the face. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it took a while, but you figured it out. <laughs> oh, it, 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 here. Well, German shepherds are one of my favorite breeds of dogs. They're beautiful, and actually, me and my husband, we absolutely want to adopt one. Um, we're just looking for the right timing because we have two cats at home and. You know what they say about cats and dogs. <laughs> yeah, I do. But but you've seen them uh, be able to mix quite well, I'm sure. And some some of the families you work with, uh, I'm sure they have cats and dogs and. Yeah. I think uh, it's I mean, more like a room. Like, I I, mean, I guess there's some truth to it, but it doesn't mean that it won't they won't get along, right? Um, yeah, I mean it's a it's a prey aspect of it because dogs are inherently predators. And then it's also the ability for them to play with each other, and sometimes it's a bit of a competitive nature as well. Yeah. Well, you have a big, big dog and a small cat, so, but actually, I'd be more worried for the dog in in my case because my cats are pretty territorial. So, all right. So, um, what led you to become like a dog trainer? Like, what was your career path, aspirations growing up? Did you always want to work? I guess you did not always want to work with animals, but uh, what was your aspirations growing up? You know, it was interesting. Um, in my 20s, I had, uh, okay, so in my 20s, I wanted to be an, an actor. Oh, I, I too, at one point, I had that dream. <laughs> so I started doing stand-up comedy in Victoria, and then eventually in my early 20s, I moved to Vancouver to pursue the, you know, the grand year that I wanted to, and I actually toured around uh, BC, and the and the north, uh, 
uh, for eight years and so forth. But starting out, I was getting married and all that. So a lot of that stuff just doesn't pay off because when you're making, you know, $125 on <laughs> That's the truth, you know, starting yes. artists, yes. <laughs> so I had to join Reality and then um, I ended up having a couple of businesses of my own. Uh, one was a um, one was a shoe store that I had and then uh, my uh, one of my suppliers was retiring and so I ended up buying out his factory in Van Nuys, California and I was there for about two and a half years wow. and run everything and unfortunately I got diluted and my mom passed away during that time frame. <clears throat> okay. Some things that happened there, and then I ended up just, um, you know, closing it all down, and just started following other aspects of, of what I wanted to do. And I had a transportation company where I was transporting uh, high value vehicles uh, around uh, Canada, and so that was not too bad. So I worked for companies like Tesla and Lamborghini, and I moved wow. the uh, I moved the Bugatti Sang Noir, which was point uh, three point four million dollars from here, Vancouver to to Montreal to the Ritz. Uh, a oh, few years. That's something. Did you that, go for a test run? Or? Oh, no, no. You're not allowed. I, oh, well, I, I could drive it in and out, but absolutely, I was like, okay, let's get your staff to move it. Yeah, because, yeah, like, I am not touching it anymore. Like, <laughs> liability, eh? <laughs> right. um, so I did that for 10 years, and then, um, you know, I, I ended up having a relationship that did not work out for me. Um, so I decided that I needed to refocus on what it is that really made me happy in my life versus um, living someone else's dream. Right. So, and you know, when you say someone else's dream, was your parents' dream? Or? Uh, no, not my parents because they had passed away. But, right. um, you know, the people I was with, you know, I was in a relationship. So right. uh, an absolutely lovely person. Uh, she's a great person and all that stuff. But unfortunately, just we did not. It turned out we did not have the same common aspects of uh, aspiration, but um, so I ended up having to. Uh, I took some time off and uh, self-reflected and wanted to find out what it is that I wanted to do. One of the things that she gave me as advice was to pursue dog training because I had oh. I had Hanka and he was in the paper and so forth. Um, uh, actually, I should uh, go back a little bit. Yeah, into, like how did you get from being scared to suddenly uh, being good with dogs? <laughs> I, okay, so um, I ended, you know, I had a divorce, 2011, and then I had gone out with somebody uh, for a couple of years, and this is another relationship, right? Um, right. And she was a great person. Uh, and when she and when we broke up, uh, and uh, she ended up adopting a Great Dane herself. Oh, okay. Gosh, this is just a you know beautiful breed, uh, it's an absolutely gorgeous breed, and so I ended up adopting one myself, which was an owner surrender a, a couple of months later. Okay. And, you know, I didn't know anything about, about an owner surrender. I didn't know that sometimes they have behavioral issues because I didn't ask the right questions. And so they I didn't ended, bother to tell you. The, the, the problem is a lot of people who do surrender to their dogs are surrendering for specific reasons, and often it's behavioral issues, and they don't tell you. Oh, okay. So, they, so it, was direct, it wasn't like a rescue. Uh, it wasn't no. like a, a shelter. It was, it was a direct. private. Okay. The private through a Facebook post, oh, and so okay. if I'd gone through a rescue, then I would have a, 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 a better understanding of disclosure on right. on Lincoln, my beloved Lincoln. So I ended up adopting him, and of course, again, like I said, is I wasn't told everything that was there. So I ended up finding out he had high reactivity. He would lunge at people unpredictably. He had significant prey drive. He would go after people who had a baseball cap on or some sort of head covering a trigger. And, yeah and I, and I didn't know any of this and I was like he would like I'd be walking across an intersection with you know a busy intersection and somebody would be walking towards us and suddenly he would lunge at this person it was a woman and of course they were really upset and frightened and I was I would be like uh, I'm sorry oh. <laughs> so this would happen happen and I ended up talking to a bunch of uh, breeders Great Dane breeders, rescues, and I contacted Elaine Dixon, who's the founder of New Hope for Danes. Oh, and, okay. And they're the oldest Great Dane rescue in Canada. So they've been around since 1982. Are and, they in uh, Vancouver? Uh, they're out of Saskatchewan. Oh, okay. And they're national. So she's, uh, Elaine has saved over 5,000 plus Great Danes in her lifetime. Wow. 
so I asked her what to do, and she and we had talked constantly because I, you know, I was never thinking of doing anything to, you know, I would never kill Lincoln. It was just that's just not cool for anyone to do that. Um, mm -hmm. So what ended up happening is I was talking to her, and I said, well, maybe I should try this. After you know, I tried the treats that everyone said. I tried to do advice that everyone told me, and it was never working at all. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense to me. So I would talk to Elaine. I said, you know, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? And she goes, just try it. And I would try it. And then I would go back to her and say, what was happening? She goes, I basically what Elaine said was, use your intuition. You've got this gift. And I was saying, no, no, I don't have this no, gift. Just, don't put that on me. Like, <laughs> and so I just kept doing what I was doing, which was treating him <laughs> like a human child. Mm. But again, with the understanding that he was still a dog, so he had a basic uh, comprehension and, and processing skills. And then uh, a few months later, I got a call from another rescue organization that brings in dogs from Taiwan, Sierra Dogs, uh, C E R A. So uh, yeah, Sierra Dogs. I heard about that. Yeah. yeah. They bring dogs in from Taiwan. So they contacted me. Said uh, they had contacted Elaine. Elaine directed them to me and basically said <laughs> um, they have a dog that is half Great Dane, half mix of something else from Taiwan that is uh, reactive to men, mm. fear. Uh, skittish and a flight risk so they said would you take her and I said yeah absolutely and I had no idea and I worked with her and a week and a half I had her off leash with recall and the rescue was su super surprised because they spent over fifteen hundred dollars on training they had their own uh, oh. uh, trainer that's on their board of directors try so nothing ever happened so it went from there and there and then I just simply started enjoying what I was doing and I just seemed to have a knack and I always was given the dogs that were reactive I'm talking about dogs that try to attack me when their owner brings them out from yeah. the You can't be too so, skittish. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty frightening uh, often. I mean, you know, when you're trapped in a small apartment at the time, uh, the having them right there uh, trying to uh, um, trying to corner you even back then is not fun. Right. So it just went from there, and then I ended up getting uh, adopting Nero, who passed away June 13th at uh, 13 years, 7 months. Adopted him at 10 years, 4 months. And uh, I had heard that he dragged an adult woman, a very, uh, you know, a 250 pound woman off the couch onto the floor, causing uh, wounds requiring 67 stitches. He wow. would try to take uh, prospective adopters and grab them, jump the fence and try to drag them over into the yard to uh, uh, injure them severely. And knowing all that information, I still accepted uh, Nero and brought him here. And then subsequently after that um, was Tonka. And then that's when the media got involved with uh, Tonka's story. Well, yeah, it was all over the papers, I imagine. Yeah, it, it was, and it was quite significant. Um, you know, over 300,000 people saw his post. So it, it put you it, on it, the map. I guess at that point, people knew, if you have a problem dog, he's the guy. <laughs> it, it's, it's on the map on both good and bad. Yeah, that's uh, right. I didn't learn how to dog train um, traditionally, so I, I, I do get quite a bit of criticism and trolling for what I do because I did not follow the traditional uh, aspect and just basically said, hey, I got a gift. Yeah. And, and, okay. and a lot of times, like what you mean by conventional methods, they use shock collars and that kind of thing. And you're, you're not, you're, you're kind of against that, I guess. You're like, it's not necessary and it's aggressive and it probably doesn't lead to the best results. It's a brute force aspect of it, and I always say this to anyone: if uh, your partner, for example, you you know, if your partner grabbed you and threw you on the ground, like Alpha, or they right. used you, they would be in jail. Yeah, of course. Why, why is that okay for us to do that to dogs when we say, and scientists say that dogs have a, a rudimentary understanding of children of of, of of a child? Yeah. Yeah, of a child. So, um, so I'm against the. I'm not against it. It's just you know what. For owners, for private people to use it, absolutely. But for someone who is a professional to use a shock collar or to use a choke collar or a prong collar, it, uh, you know, with all due respect to these people out there, it is a, a demonstration of inexperience and uh, and uh, um, limited skill set on it. So uh, I don't use treats either. Yeah. And so all the dogs, including the predators. I've always used a regular collar and leash, and that's it, nothing else. And I read the dogs at two tenths of a second, wow. so my processing time is pretty quick. And um, yeah, so so I'm not really against it. I would love to just see a bit more education. I agree. I agree, 100%.
Uh, so I guess your journey, so you basically took some time off uh, from the car, um, I guess, I closed transport, out. and then you had developed this knack with dogs, and somebody kind of said maybe you should work it with dogs, and you decided to pursue that, I suppose. Yes. Um, you know, it was a, a really deep introspection in my own life, and I, I had to figure out who I was. And what was going to make me happy and yeah. I think anything else uh, you know we all go through this midlife crisis we all go through this fulfillment the self-fulfillment and passion and what are we here on this earth for right. and I had to figure it out besides people telling me uh, you know Elaine Dixon uh, other people uh, my ex-girlfriend all telling me to pursue this I resisted and then I eventually just needed you know a few months to figure out what it was that I was gonna do and I, I shut my business down I literally walked away from it Mm -hmm. and people were like what you closed it down and it's, it, was, it seems a little crazy at the time but you know you had to do it yeah. there, there's significant money in, in close uh, high value vehicle transport yeah. so I'll, i just literally walked away from it uh, um and then i just started working with dogs and uh it was a very hard um a hard hard difficult time because uh every time i did something i was attacked and i want i'm not talking about just attack i'm talking about dozens of people would go after me um, the same group as well, and so uh, emotionally it was really tough. Psychologically, it was tough to have uh, this intense amount of bullying from adults coming after me over things that they themselves couldn't do. But instead of wanting to learn and save other dogs' lives, they would instead attack the person who could do something that they couldn't do. Oh. So it's, it's 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 mental. Yeah. Well, you know, like you said, you know, it's a limited skill set, education, and you know, that's what bullies do. But I guess that period of time has come and gone. And at this point, you're hopefully uh, gains the respect of the people that you help. You know, you helped a lot of people throughout the years. And I imagine. <laughs> yeah, so my advocacy goes from that part of it, too, as well. And there's just one thing to be a, a dog trainer or, or behaviorist. It is another thing to create advocacy and put my own money where my mouth is in that sense. So I do the pro bono aspect for countless people for up to three dozen rescue organizations internationally, but then also the advocacy. And the advocacy is a very important thing to me because the dogs are being killed. There's almost six million dogs that are killed annually in North America in shelters and owner-directed killings due to behavior. In fact, I, I put up a live broadcast the other day, last night, Yeah. five different dogs already in, in a week. And they always, whenever I get a call, it's always about a dog being killed. So these behavioral aspects are what we're ha what are happening, and if we have a dissonance with the behavior of dogs, means that the dog's being killed due to cruelty, due to for meat and so forth. In, in China and Asia, yeah. is that, it's not in my yard, my my backyard, so I don't have to worry about it. But then they don't realize what's happening here in in North America itself. Oh, well, that's very true, and um, let's get on to uh, the dog cat meat trade because you you touched upon that and. Uh, for me personally, it all started with Yulin. I discovered Yulin Dog Meat Festival only two years ago. And actually, I heard it, like I had heard the, the term Yulin. I, I just wasn't sure what it was about. And I never looked into it until at one point I realized, man, I, I'm a little curious at this point. Like I heard like dogs are being tortured. And of course, lo and behold, the internet is filled with images and videos, all the more gruesome. And actually that awoken the activist in me. I had never been an animal activist. In fact, for most of my childhood, I didn't really particularly care for animals. Uh, I grew up with a Great Dane. Actually, my dad loved Great Danes. And he was, he was beautiful, he was big, and he was a sweetheart. Like, we got him from day one, he was a little puppy, and my dad would spend uh, hours on the couch, you know, like, petting him when he was young. So he was not remotely aggressive. Um, but I, you know, I was like, okay, it's a dog, you know, <laughs> like, not more than that. And then I guess I developed my love for animals when I adopted my first cat in 2011. Um, my, my cat's actually there, but you know, I can't see him. Um, he's very quiet, very cooperating. They're both there, actually. Hmm. Um, so I developed my love when I adopted uh, my first cat. I realized how amazing animals are, and they're a true gift. 
And no matter how bad your day is, you come home, you see your beautiful, you know, cat or dog, and you just instantly become happy, you know? So for me, it's like therapy. <laughs> I'm very grateful. It's, um, it's pretty good therapy. So when I heard the Yulin Dog Meat Festival, I just, it, filled me with rage and I could not believe this was happening. And then of course, as I researched, I discovered that it's not just an annual festival, it's an everyday occurrence. And it's not just China, it's everywhere in Asia. Like we're talking about South Korea, we're talking about Cambodia, Thailand. Thailand is doing a lot of, you know, like I think they progress quite a bit and they're they're one of the better countries, but it's still happening. Uh, and uh, we're talking about Vietnam, Indonesia, just everywhere. And I just do not understand it. So my question for all my guests are, when was the first time you heard about the Yulin Dog Meat Festival? Uh, it was around 2016. And I had seen some of it show up on my Facebook, and because obviously social media is the best way to, to, to distribute that. And I saw the pictures, and of course, uh, like anybody, and these are horrific pictures, as you know, and yeah. you know, we, right? So I thought, okay, well, you know, this is not real. Yeah. Right off the bat, okay, I not mean, real. I, I thought it was like a joke, a sick joke. <laughs> yeah, or it's an isolated situation, and, right. and so I started looking around and, and become morbidly fascinated with this. And of course, my astonishment were just unbelievable, so I started looking more, and I actually, Start, you know, I, I saw things like John, you know, with, with soy dogs. You're talking about Thailand and all right. that. I saw um, the stuff he was talking about, but it was somewhat sanitized. And then as I kept looking deeper and deeper, then I started seeing the other advocates that were involved in it. And I came upon uh, Mark Ching, uh, his post from Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation. And so I saw the videos, and it is absolutely a horrific videos. You know, the videos were. Animals are the, the, their paws are being nail gunned to the. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I, can't, I can't watch that. Like it's just beyond me. But I I, I know enough. <laughs> yeah, that's traumatizing. It is extremely traumatizing. So I just kept looking for it, and then what actually got me started was when I looked at what was happening. And of course, you know, we feel ineffective out of a sea of a billion people that's in Asia and and, and a certain type of uh, uh, governmental perspective on these things right. uh, I condone this so I then started making memes and I would do memes about different uh, large charitable organizations and I would do these pretty strong memes where I would uh, for example there's a, a very significant um, organization internationally that uh, is known out of the United States and then they they yeah. go out there okay so um, so <laughs> but what was what was even more shocking is how much they always kept saying, we need donations, we're going to try to stop uh, right. you, Lynn, and so forth. And then I did a, I looked at their financials, which is publicly available on their website. They brought in, in 2015, declared to the IRS in revenue, $411 million. Oh, my Lord, yeah. So even 200... more now, in recent years, I think 2018 was almost a billion. Wow. It's crazy. So, a lot of money. So, so it's, it's, it's money before dogs, and so I started doing those memes, and it, I mean, it was just brutal. I mean, they, they, they got $140 million in cash in, in 2015. They, they had $220 million offshore in the Caribbean. They're paying over $10 million to the two collective boards, because the, the one that's domestic in the United States plus the one that is international. Okay. So those, those collectively with the same CEO uh, are paying themselves over $10 million. So uh, it, it, was, it was infuriating because they're claiming to help dogs. But they're not doing anything to help the dogs that they're, that they're advertising on all their email blasts. Mm -hmm. So I did those memes. I did the memes against another organization that's out in Asia that de deals with bears. And I found that there's a lot of improprietary, uh, improprietary, I can't even pronounce the word, but there's a lot of things that were not uh, legit that were happening as well. Okay. And uh, found out that that founder was paying herself over a million dollars on, on salary. Oh. A whole bunch of unfortunate things. So, um, so I just kept going and doing memes, and I kept doing memes, and I kept doing memes, and I started getting recognized. And you're, then you're I were posting these memes where exactly? Uh, Instagram or? Yeah, on Twitter and on Facebook. And then I started getting a following of people uh, who who would you know recognize that I was sincere and I was out there helping, helping the uh, you know not really helping but speaking out against the trade. Right. That, uh, 
My cat's oh. here. <laughs> I think he wants to go out. Anyways. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so you, I guess we're, are we going to name these organizations or you'd rather not? But you've already put it out there, so. Yeah, I put it out there. I mean, if I name one organization, then I have to name them all because I can't just go be selective. But, you know, unfortunately, uh, a lot of people get into this charitable aspect of saving dogs. Right. Just across the board, generally speaking, um, they get involved with good intentions and then they find the lucrative aspects of donations. And that becomes a, a, a primary focus for people. Unfortunately, they lose sight of what's going on. Um, you know, those organizations are doing good work. For example, you know, um, you know, the organization in, in Thailand is doing great work, and oh, they're talking about soy dog. Because I'm going to interview John actually. Yeah, he's a great man. Yeah. So he's, you know, he, he's, he stopped, uh, you know, over a million dogs being killed, essentially. So, so he's done really great work. And to me, uh, the personal uh, behavior of, of, of uh, certain individuals, um, I have to weigh on the part of do I, do I um, uh, identify publicly these people who I hear information from, people who have been on their board of directors and right. trustees and stuff like that. Do I publicize that where it affects their ability to save these lives, right? So if someone is taking a million dollars and putting it into a different bank account, yeah, I rather they do that while they're still saving a hundred thousand dogs, for example, right? Because you know there, there's that scale has to happen. Well, it's criminal. I mean, when people give donations, they want to help the cause, and to know that your donation is actually doing nothing but filling someone's pockets, and it's criminal, and it's actually yeah. one of the worst crimes you could commit, in my opinion. I mean, the people, the, the, the person paying the price is really the victim. And in this case, these poor dogs are being victimized all over again, you know, so it's terrible. Yeah. I, you have an organization that say, for example, has $100 million in donations, they can easily eradicate uh, a significant portion oh, yeah. of the trade. Yeah. Of course. And it's such a shame because they have the the funds, the resources, they could do it, but you know, greed. If they don't want to. It's, it's about the money. It's all about the money. And actually, that is one aspect of the dog cat meat trade that's keeping it alive is because these butchers and traders are making money. And um, why Mark Ching is working more on the legislative aspects now because he's done multiple trips. And I guess most viewers know between 2015, 2017, his goal was to document what was happening to have proof that this is actually happening. And uh, the torture, he's actually put himself in very precarious situations to document this. And now that he got the footage, he got more than enough footage to prove it, I guess his point is trying to just instill animal welfare laws in those countries that at least, you know, ultimately we want a ban altogether on this um, meat trade. Uh, because it's inhumane, it's cruel, it's horrible. And these people are not eating dogs because they have nothing else to eat. It's not poor people eating dogs because dogs cost a lot of money. Like dog meat is a delicacy. It's expensive. It's not for the poor people. The poor people eat rice and, you know, beans and that's about it. <laughs> you know, and there's so many misconceptions. People are like, well, that's all they have. It's the same thing as eating a cow, but it's not. It's very different. It's on top of their existing um, conventional meat industry because they do have factory farms in China. They have a lot of factory farms. They eat more pork than any other nation. So <laughs> my son is wanting my attention. Um, so so that's, um, I guess, uh, I don't know, at this point, what I'm trying to get at is uh, you heard about the dog meat, uh, well, you, Lynn, firstly, like yes. me, that was your first introduction. Um, I, it, it, actually, it wasn't you, Lynn, itself, but it was, it was stuff that was before that happening. Then I found out about you, Lynn, afterwards, and oh, okay. that, that was shocked than anything else. And so you started doing these memes and uh, po posting them. They became popular, I suppose, and it opened people's eyes. And uh, what was the evolution? Like, I, I, did you ever like meet Mark Ching, or did you get ever get involved in in some of those organizations that you respect and uh, to help the dog meat trade? Or uh, I, I did get the opportunity uh, about three years ago when I went down. Um, 
before you know Nero, my great Dane was was old, so I did not want to be gone from here if something ever happened to him, especially for a great Dane, as you know. Yeah. So I I had gone down there. Uh, I was invited to um, meet up with Mark as well, which I did meet up with him. And oh, um, what year was that? Uh, two thousand uh, two thousand sixteen, okay. in the summer of sixteen. So I met with him uh, briefly. He is a very busy man. Um, you know, he has uh, devoted a lot of his life to what he is doing across the board. And he, he, I do know that there's a lot of things that are incorrectly said about him. Um, but I can say from my own personal experience that I believe in the sincerity and the validity of what he's saying. And I believe he's a genuine individual. And um, out of all the people that I know of in the uh, dealing with the meat, meat trade, uh, I would say that he is the one person, one of the few people that I believe is sincere, regardless of what's being said. And this has nothing to do with anything else other than my own personal opinion. Um, when it comes to uh, uh, John Sessa from Vanderpump Dogs, right. he had invited me to meet up with him. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, the, the relationship that I... Uh, oh my God, oh. my cat just decided to come. But he's he's a little bit camera shy. Okay. There goes the cat. Oh, well. All right. Um, sorry about that. So John Sessa of Vanderpump. Well, actually, it's Stop Human Forever, and they have Vanderpump uh, Dog Foundation, right? So that's Lisa Vanderpump. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, I, I, you know, he, he had he had seen that a lot of people were, um, you know, uh, looking forward to me arriving in L.A. Uh, for a visit. So he invited me down there to, to uh, just talk with him. Um, you know, I don't think that uh, uh, my perspective is similar to, to John's. Uh, I have a, a much more um, pristine focus on things. When it comes to other people, um, I was, uh, I met with Karen Gifford. Karen Gifford? Okay. Sorry. Gifford, I uh, met with her. Um, and and she's a, she? Uh, she's known as an animal advocate, and she oh. works very, uh, especially with the meat dog trade, and she works uh, somewhat close with, uh, Mark Ching as well in regards right. to getting, you know, the dogs out and so forth. And um, I met with Gretchen Leaf, who runs Davy's Voice. Oh, okay. Davy's uh, Voice. All these things that I wasn't aware of. I guess we'll discover more about. Yeah, this. Davy's Voice is a is an organization that's a charity. Uh, it was established on a story of a of a dog named Davy that was severely beaten, uh, and then subsequently died. But uh, Davy's Voice is a advocacy group, which essentially ends a charity. That works with the governor's office of California, and um, they're based out of Santa Barbara. And Gretchen um, is a very kind, uh, compassionate person as well, similar to like Mark. And so, um, you know, we became friends as well. And she has, and you know, allowed me to stay over at her home uh, with her family and all that. So it's a it's a super nice relationship. Uh, I was able to meet with uh, Zach Scow from Marley's Mutts uh, later on. Uh, Marley's Mutts. Marley's he, Mutts, okay. Yeah, so we're going right. to jot all those things down and I'll actually set up some links because I'm, I'm curious to learn more about these organizations. Yeah. So uh, Zach is a really uh, amazing, compassionate, humanistic man. And um, he has gone through a lot of things in his life that you know, he, he, he's already said that he should have died uh, oh. from, you know, just kidney issues and so forth, like the health issues and all that. And he continues to work forth. So him, Mark Ching, you know, uh, Gretchen Leaf, these are people who are dedicated to the advocacy and the welfare of dogs uh, in that part of it. But um, I know that, um, uh, Mark, uh, sorry, I know that Zach has gone over to, uh, you know, look at the aspects of the meat dog trade himself as well. It's, it's tough. Nobody wants to go see that. It's, it's incredibly scarring. I, I could not have that bravery or courage that they have. Well, I agree with you because uh, just seeing the images on the screen is traumatizing enough. I can't imagine witnessing it firsthand in person. And in fact, I think I would end up in jail because I could not, you know, I could not just watch that happen. I don't know. Um, so uh, obviously at this point, I would like to, to learn more about what you think are the plausible solutions to ending this meat trade. So we talk about legislative efforts like the uh, petition that you started and what made you start that petition? I needed to do something. Yeah. You know, I, know. I was, I was, I was we trying to feel so powerless. We're like, what am I going to do? Yeah. And, and 
we, when we feel powerless, we have two choices. Either we do something or we continue to say we're going to do something. <laughs> so, I mean, for me, uh, you know, I, I have been in situations where dogs will kill me. And it's not, a, it's not an embellishment. It's a reality. So, for one thing is I stopped eating meat because of that. And, um, you know, Perhaps. I know what's going on. Um, and then when it came to the part of advocacy, I, I, there's nothing I could do in China. And I had been invited uh, by Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation uh, by Dr. Uh, Jennifer uh, Gitlitz. Gitlitz, sorry. Right, I know, it's a tough name. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, I was invited over and, I, and I've always declined uh, because I'm just, don't, like, you, like you, I could not handle it. And I would it's be, too uh, sensitive, yeah, like, I'm too sensitive. So, um, so I knew I had to do something, and I and I had read articles about it happening here in Canada, where people were stealing um, people's dogs and cats oh. and cats. So I didn't it, know. I didn't know this. Yeah. So there's some there's a couple of things that happened in Alberta. Uh, one in out in Montreal. Um, there's a there's a there's a person who is a friend of mine, Yoko. Um, I can give you her information later on. She's actually friend with them. Um, uh, someone by the name of Mia Forster, and so uh, she she and I are friends, and she has told me some things. Uh, and one of the things is also that she was aware that there is a underground meat trade in Montreal. Oh my God! In Montreal, this is my city, so I'm a little bit shocked. I had yeah. no idea. Uh, so so that's happening here in Vancouver. I had heard from one owner who said that they used to live in Burnaby, and their neighbor who was from an East Asia country, you know, right. uh, Asian country, who had, um, uh, he was he was in their apartment, and they were next door to them, and they heard a dog crying and crying and screaming and yelling, and then they stopped screaming and yelling uh, and crying, and then the next day they were talking to the, the neighbors and said, what was that noise? I mean, you know, is your dog okay? And they said, oh, no, we, 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 we killed our dog to eat him. So, oh, okay, they just, uh, you know, admitted it. Yeah, it, it, was just, it was just, you know, but because it's not illegal. Whoa, I had no clue. I thought it was really just to join the uh, movement uh, that was, you know, started in the States with um, the law. I had no idea this was happening. Like, it is an actual problem. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is an underground aspect of it. It's not as prevalent as, as we all think it is, but the cruelty is still there. And because I we mean, have such one a dog is one dog too many, right? So, oh my God. So, on Canadian soil, this is happening. So, yeah. In Burnaby, and um, you know, these people who had hired me to work with their dog had no reason to make these things up, because we just had a really nice, frank, open, honest conversation, yeah. and they were just we were talking about the meat dog trade, and they said, "Yeah, you know, this is what I heard next door," and I went, "Wow!" Oh and I said, yeah. "And they phoned the police about it, and the police said there's nothing they can do about it because, because there's, there's no law. No it's law. not illegal." Okay, so this petition is actually much more important now than I thought. Like, initially, I thought it was a nice effort, <laughs> but now it's really, really much more important than I thought. And I suppose um, in Chinatowns, like uh, Vancouver is a big Chinatown and Montreal too, do you think like restaurants serve dog and cat meat? Like, I've seen some advertisements where cat soup in Vancouver area, so. You know, I, I would say that I think it's um, not really valid because I, I am highly doubtful that there would be any restaurant that is legitimate that is going to, to sell cat or dog meat because, one, the preparation and it would invite the health inspectors in and it obviously invite a significant public outcry. Right. And if they do it, we would never know. But I don't want to say that that is happening. And I, and I will say yeah. for the record, personally and professionally, I am doubtful that it, that is even happening at all because again there's just too many people with too many mouths that would say something here in vancouver okay um but they don't say something in china and actually you brought upon like a good point because it's a food safety issue and that's what's helped a lot of uh, the dog meat trade being uh, banned in thailand well in some parts of thailand because of the food safety issue it is i mean these dogs are strays they have rabies, some of them. They have a bunch of diseases. It's not safe for human consumption. Uh, not to mention that it's grotesque, but <laughs> you know, that, that could be a good point. But in China, I guess um, they're not that big on food safety. <laughs> it's not a big, you know, uh, big issue over there. I believe the, 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 okay. So we talked about earlier in regards to the why and what can we do. Yeah. And 
I think that the organizations themselves are fractured all globally. Every single organization is fractured. They're, they're, they're uh, you know, uh, self-interest in regards to following the same path. And the problem that happens is the people who are part of that group and joining these this group or that group and all that, uh, um, they're not recognizing the fact that that's what will always happen. There will always be a fracture. It will never be cohesive. And if we keep trying to bring everyone together, it's never going to work and we're going to dilute our focus. So what is better to do is to promote each individual organization that is uh, respectable and legitimate to have them move forward into their own aspects and prove it that they are able to help the dog and cat meat trade be eradicated from Asia. Uh, the other part is the legislation, right? Unfortunately, the UK uh, spoke out of fear and, and denied that aspect. Yeah. Very disappointing, but it's a setback. Uh, we're hoping uh, we'll still have a chance. Yeah. So um, here in Canada, uh, you know, seeing that happening in the news in regards to our petition here or my petition here, uh, the concern is, will that be the same evidence that will occur? I'm hoping not. And if it does happen that way, then I'm going to have to push the petition a little bit harder to bring in a little bit more public pressure in so that they do want to move forward. Because I, I'm, I don't think they have a petition going on in the UK. So, again, uh, for me, I was extremely fortunate that uh, Member of Parliament, Honorable Ken Hardy, right. uh, immediately, like within like 24 hours of my email sent out to his office, his assistant contacted me and said, yeah, Mr. Hardy would like to meet with you. I wow, went, uh, that's so cool. I said, when do you want, when do you want to meet? And he goes, <laughs> he me. I said, how about tomorrow? And he, they went, yeah, okay. And he, he met with me privately, right. and, and we had a 15-minute discussion. He's cognizant about everything that's going on. He's got his own pets, his own dogs and cats. So yeah. he's an animal lover. And then this is why he's going forward. And he's also gone to the Minister of uh, Ministry of Justice, sorry, Minister of Justice, right. and the Minister of Agriculture federally on both aspects. When it comes to the fracture that we have here, uh, if we finally resign, unfortunately, to the fact that it's never going to be cohesive and that we can work compartmentalize and have some sort of respectful affiliations, that's going to happen. When it comes to the Asia aspect of it is, what I think is missing out of the entire DCMT trade of all those advocates who are fighting against it is the misunderstanding that by cajoling and intimidating and forcing and creating petitions, etc., like that, have done nothing and will continue to do nothing. Things that are legislative, like what John is doing at Soy Dogs, yeah. that's going to work. That part where he's going after that governmental process he has to and he's you see the way he's processed that aspects of of advertising the the dcmt trade and outlawing it he brings in the parts of the medical health issues he brings in the part about the illegalities of it right. and the other part that i think is prevalent in asia itself the continent itself unfortunately is the low education mm, yeah well therein lies the problem yeah it's a lot of perpetuating the same this like cycle. A lot of these um, the dog meat trade happens in uh, poor parts of China. I guess is that fair to say? Yes. Um, well, so it, 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 it's usually. It, I mean, could you, like you were saying about the people who are young and, and are still kind of uh, participating in this aspect. Right. It's just the ignorance. Well, I, I think the the like the young people you're, you're talking about, like I said, that you know, like we're hoping it's a generational issue, and eventually the younger generation being much more influenced by Western culture and, and Western ways of being, uh, seeing that dogs and cats are mostly considered pets in most of the world, uh, would would not pursue the dog cat meat trade and would you know obviously pursue a higher endeavors. Um, so that, that's our hope, but then you see footage of at the annual dog meat festival and and Yulin, and you see a lot of young people too. So are like mm. uh, a lot of tourists. It attracts a lot of tourists. Um, sadly enough, I think some people are like, oh my God, it's a festival. You get to eat dog meat, something we don't do in our country. So uh, I get, I don't know. <laughs> so you're saying um, what what's been done by most of these organizations that might have started out with like good intentions? It's not working. Petitions, shaming, and all that stuff. It's not working. Uh, and instead, we have to focus on education and legislative efforts. But it's hard, like especially China. It's, I mean, it's a very stubborn country, and they don't like foreigners meddling into their affairs 
So how would you go about um, trying to negotiate with those uh, governments, I guess? <laughs> you know, when it comes to the political aspects of it, I think it's important that um, the governments that are doing such as the United States, uh, with the Farm Bill Act, with HR yeah. 67, going on the political aspects of them, there is that legal groundwork to say, hey, you know what, what you're doing is not cool, and we've actually made it illegal in our modernized yeah. country. Um, when it comes to Asia and so forth, the uh, misconception and the ignorance is the belief that, uh, you know, and don't mean to be graphic here again, but the, the beating and torture and the severe torture of dogs before they're killed is to, you know, increase. And again, I'm saying this is just a, a ridiculous myth that's never been proven medically or science. No, increase men's virility, yes. <laughs> So they talk about beating the dog, the meat tastes better and increases man's virility and so forth like that. And so they, they go on that. So that what then points out to is the low education. What then that points out to is the fact that it is ignorance. And then that points out to the insecurity of the population itself. And the population is insecure to the point where they have to eat dog meat, thinking that it's going to give them virility. It means that they need egotism. It means that they have that machismo that they don't have. It means that they have the insecurity that we need to prey on and play on it through an advertising campaign. And that advertising campaign, which I have presented uh, novelty-wise in a novel format to people, is that what we need to do is the advertising, as opposed to showing pictures of dogs being killed yeah. on, on the, to the buses, because everyone sees that and they just go to the market in, you know, in, in, in Korea and they see it anyway. So they, they see exactly what they want to eat and they go, oh, yeah, I'm hungry now. <laughs> but if it yeah. ends up, because these guys are talking about making themselves virile and masculine and so forth. Right. Let's put out some ads. Let's have somebody with some intelligence put out some ads where they have a dog meat eater who looks like this gangly, disgusting, effeminate <laughs> moron. Yeah. And next to it is a man, an Asian man, who's a good-looking, strong, virile man saying, I don't need to eat dog meat. Why does this guy need to? Wow. I mean, who? it, it took you to think of this. Like, that's a brilliant strategy. And Thank you, you said you proposed it to whom? I proposed it to a couple of organizations, and they just went, oh, okay, great, thank you. And they never went forward with it at all. Maybe Animal Hope and Wellness? You know, I, I presented to a number of organizations, and nobody took me up on that aspect of it. I think that's course. brilliant. I mean, I mean, actually, it targets the ego, and the ego is going to respond. You know, obviously, if you see that everywhere, like, do I want to be the good-looking guy that's smart and gets the chicks or do I want to look like that <laughs> and you know that would be great I think that's yeah. like, brilliant <laughs> well I, I think so and because it's so simplistic in its format I think people don't think it's going to work and I think that they are so uh, terrorized and uh, emotionally uh, invested that they're just still going, no, we've got to show the atrocities. And I, you know, I know the atrocities, you know the atrocities, everyone knows the At atrocities. At this point, the whole world has seen it. And uh, it's still not making much headway. So I think you're right. We need a new tactic, you know? The marketing aspect of it, again, it's the same thing that when you do luxury brands. How do they make the luxury brand even more luxurious? They, oh, the Brogatti, the Bugatti, the Lamborghini. Yes. <laughs> The it's latest uh, luxury icon, you know, so yeah. The okay looking guy with a good looking girlfriend or yeah. wife. <laughs> right, so that's what I thought would happen because again, let's go to the root of the psychology yeah. of the issue. Because if they know even in their heads that it's not working, but they believe that myth that the virility is there, yeah. or that it keeps the stomach warm and it cools the body down in the summer months, let's bring that up to a point where... Let's low... debunk it. <laughs> I mean, that's, so, that's really smart. Actually, uh, when this video posts, we'll ask uh, viewers to comment, and I'm sure we'll get a lot of votes for that uh, campaign to be, to be uh, taken seriously. So, um, in your opinion, at this point, uh, we're talking about solutions and the petition. Where are we at with the petition? At this point, we've got over 100,000. Initially, yeah. we wanted 150 to present it to Parliament, but at this stage, it's enough? or? Yeah, I mean, my, my internal goal was 100,000, which okay. was a, a very difficult number to achieve in any aspect Strangely of it. Strangely enough, yeah. Like, you think it's a no-brainer? Like, yeah, no one wants to eat dogs and cats, but people are like... I mean, I had problems with certain, um, you know, uh, pet supply stores. They didn't want to promote it. They were like, oh, you know, we don't want to show that kind of graphic, you know, like... Exactly the graphic. Yeah, like I'm like, well, we don't have to have graphic images, but you know, they just didn't want to bring about an issue. 
to their clients that, you know, is it really happening? Like they don't want to trouble the, the mindset of their clients, I guess. But then I had some other uh, great pet supply stores that really backed me up and helped me promote the petition, which are great. You know, I can name them. Uh, so there's Little Bear um, Pet uh, Supply Store in Westmount and also Tropical Zoo. That's in my region. It's in St. Great Paul. accent. <laughs> Tropical Zoo. Uh, it's a uh, French. Uh, so uh, they've been wonderful. They actually, I, I asked them to hold a, post a petition during the Human Dog Meat Festival days in 2019. And that's only 10 days. And they said, no, no, we'll keep it going. Uh, they still have it in their store. And they even took my, my cards with the Montreal Stop Yulin uh, information and they're like showing it around and people signing. So I got quite a few uh, signatures with them. And then obviously the, the vet hospitals I approach, a lot of them were like, well, you know, if we say yes to you, we're going to have to say yes to so many other requests. So they basically promoted it internally with their staff. And then they ask, you know, obviously they put them on their social media, like the individual vets and, you know, so hopefully, hopefully we'll get there. But what do you think are our chances of getting this law passed in 2019? Uh, I mean, I know that Honorable Hardy is going to, hopefully he gets elected and we're going to work towards having him reelected, especially in my region here. Um, and so he's the one who would be the one to bring it to the House of Commons. So when I, uh, I had an email exchange with him about two months ago for a status update, he stated after the election, he is looking for it and hoping to be able to present it to the House of Commons in December around that time frame. That's true, right? The election is kind of a bad timing for this, I suppose, because we're not sure who's going to be in office, right? Yeah, I mean, especially now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know, I, I mean, it's just like... Uh, we've all seen it on TV, right? Like, Just brutal. That's well, yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's terrible. All he had to do was this, and that would have been it. <laughs> so, no, but, you know, you know the, the worst part is, that he was asked, how many times did you do that? And he said, I, I don't know. <laughs> he lost count. <laughs> it's crazy. Anyways, we're, I guess folks at home probably know what we're talking about, but if, if not, let's move on. So um, <laughs> we're going to make an attempt to present it in, uh, to Parliament in December. And... Yeah, so Honorable Harding, uh, he, Hardy, um, Honorable Hardy will be presenting it to the House of Commons uh, just to have it uh, open as a discussion. And then from that point, if it is accepted on the vote, then right. they will move forward to the next step of it, which is to, I guess, start to look at doing, uh, um, you know, research and, surveys and so forth like that to see the validity of its interest in the Canadian public and then moving forward on that end. Um, I do know that Animal Hope and Wellness uh, Foundation, they have the wing Animal Hope and Legislation, is also trying to work towards getting that brought here in Canada. And so they're doing their thing, I'm doing my thing as well. And hopefully, the, you know, we get it on both sides. Right. I think we're having a little bit of technical difficulty. Hopefully, I don't know, the, the image is a little bit, uh, um, you're coming in. Can you still see me? Yeah. You, okay. You're very clear. No. I guess we'll, we'll wrap it up, um, shortly. Maybe we'll have you on the show again <laughs> so we can talk some more cause I, you're, you're very interesting and we have so much to talk about. So, um, for this uh, episode, basically, I guess we talked about the petition and uh, the solutions. And I would like to end it on, um, well, I guess, how you started the Arf Arf Bark Bark Foundation. A dream. It, it was really a dream. It was a dream. It was like, a, you know, in my head, like a, a vision in the sense that I want to do something more than what I was doing. And because at that time I didn't realize it, but I knew I had a certain uh, gift with dogs and I do something and for me on an ethical and moral basis not a financial basis i needed to do something to help other dogs and not just my own and to do what other people were saying was incredible with lincoln i wanted to do that with other dogs so i thought i needed to formalize it and create a rescue foundation to you know add legitimacy versus just saying i'm just going to do this and i'm doing this right. with all that started that part and then my foundation has you know as we as i try to get my feet on it because it's just me that runs it 
uh, I wanted to figure out what it is that I want to do in advocacy as well as training. So the advocacy is regards to, you know, hopefully one day, you know, not just this petition, but hopefully one day we're going to have dogs recognized as functional sentient beings. And I have an incredible uh, legal argument for that that's already existing in the gray area of society now of, of, of law. Okay. Which, which okay, um, which is basically the dogs are seen as property. Oh, and yeah, yeah, like that's crazy. So here's the thing is, if, so say for example you're a passenger or you're driving your car and someone hits your car, it's their fault, they're liable, you can sue them for damages to your vehicle and you can sue them for psychological counsel. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Well, the dogs, if your dog gets attacked by someone else's dog and you have to take them to a trainer, you can get your money back for your vet bills and you can get your money back for your training. What is the training being recompensed for? What is that training being awarded for? So is the court saying that the dog is broken and materially speaking the dog is being fixed or is the dog being fixed for his psychological damage that the training needs to repair? Mm -hmm. That's the gray area and if we can get that recognized as not a material uh, award but it is a psychological award because it is happening throughout North America, then we can look towards moving dogs as functional sentient beings with, a, with minimal and limited amount of cognitive and emotional processing, thus giving them limited legal rights. Perfect. So, so that's that part of it there. Okay, and uh, the foundation, so you started in what year? Uh, I think 2016. Okay, so around the same time where you went to, to meet uh, Mark Ching and uh, you had that trip in California. Okay, so the foundation, like you said, it's not run solely by you at this point. You have some partners. Can you tell us a little bit more about Tracy and Sharon? Oh, um, I had mentioned in, in my message there to you, uh, I'm not working with them anymore. In fact, <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay. It's just I, I have a, a, a very directed focus on my mandate, and I don't like to try different things. If, In my aspect of uh, perspective is let's keep to the simplicity of things. Right. And let's keep that right. And they are running that rescue. Uh, Tracy's running that rescue, so she's extremely busy herself. So it's hard to do extraneous uh, directions on things that stay focused on on these little core aspects of it. But then again, those little core aspects do require a lot of time, as you yourself can tell with yeah. your own podcast. So uh, Tracy, uh, she has a, a rescue shelter of her own, I guess? Yeah, she runs a rescue that brings in dogs from Taiwan. And oh, her... okay. Siri. Um, or oh, uh, is it Siri? Uh, it's called Kugo, C-O-O-G-O, Kugo Rescue. Okay, but if for, uh, while we're talking about Taiwan, I thought it's illegal, right? But the dog cat me trade in, in Taiwan, I think it was, it's banned. Uh, it's been a, a couple of years, or at least. Yeah, uh, I believe in 2016, or no, sorry, 2017 is when the legislation became law in the early 2017 era, where it was illegal to kill dogs and cats without justifiable medical reasons to do so. Okay. So what ended up happening is all these dogs that would normally have been killed or, you know, unfortunately killed for just space and whatever were not being killed uh, because they weren't allowed to be killed, right? And I, I hate to be so graphic in that term. I don't want to use euthanasia because it's an excuse for us to sanitize that, that right. word, medical term of, of compassion. So what ends up happening is these dogs are being killed because there's no space, there's too many dogs, because there's almost two million stray dogs in Taiwan. Oh, wow. Two million, so, yeah. And because it's illegal or, you know, not, you can't eat dog and cat meat. So they, they are left with a lot of uh, dogs that they don't know how to deal with, you know? So, okay, so yeah. that organization, they probably, um, do they rehabilitate them over there or they send them to different places in the world where they can be receiving treatment and uh, go on to adoption? Um, they'll bring in dogs from Taiwan to Vancouver, Canada okay. and stop them out here as well. And that's sort of their focus because they're Vancouver based here. Right. So they'll send them out. Um, you know, it's a very difficult situation in Taiwan, again, with all the number of dogs that are stray. Right. So they are trying, and it's, it's a difficult part because a lot of these stray dogs in Taiwan are um, skittish. Uh, a lot of them have issues that yeah. when they get there, people don't understand how to deal with the skittishness because, you know, you, you read the misinformation out there from, uh, you know, conventional training information about that. So then the dogs come in, they're really traumatized and they remain traumatized here. Um, and that all comes back from the way the dogs are treated in Taiwan and right. in China and Asia. They're, they're, you know, 
they, they have they have animal traps out there which are illegal, but people set animal traps on purpose. Uh, for the reason it is, they, they throw, they try to kill, they poison the dogs out there, the stray dogs, etc. They do whatever they can to uh, get rid of a stray population that is of their own doing. Right. Um, one other thing I want to say is uh, there was a time where those dogs in Taiwan, once the legislation came in, a lot of those dogs were being rounded up that they could not kill legally and being sent to the meat dog trade. And, and other countries. Yeah, to, to China. Yeah. To, yeah. Well, so, that, uh, that soy dog, I, I think they stopped, uh, I think, 500,000 dogs from being exported to Vietnam uh, that were being exported for the meat trade. Yeah. So, um, so, so you're working alone, basically. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the dogs I work with, these are dogs that will kill people. And um, it's, again, it's hard to bring someone else in, I guess, at that point. Yeah. I've had experienced people and experienced dog people and, and trainers and behaviorists, and they are, they are visibly afraid to be around my dogs or the dogs that belong to other people. Wow. So it's a one man show. <laughs> it, it's a one man show, one person show. Uh, what I do can be taught to other people. If you, you look at my website, right, with that link to the testimonials. Yes, and the, yes, we'll link um, your, your website up for sure. Yeah. So, so on that, you can see where I've read uh, the behaviors of people's dogs through their photos and their, their uh, descriptions. And I have an accuracy of 100% on reading the psychological profiles and how to remedy the, them. And then I'm teaching those owners how to do it with simple aspects of human conventional terms. Right. So what I'm... That's my, my mandate is to start educating and sharing my gift uh, with uh, the public, with dog owners, so that they can uh, themselves see the visceral and the intuitive connection that they have with their dogs and that the dogs are not just animals. Um, you know, when people try to treat, train a dysfunctional dog, it's completely counterintuitive. Uh, because they, they, they rely on Pavlov, which is 1897 theory, 122 years ago when people owned slaves and, and women couldn't vote. The, you know, and I always say treat training is like uh, giving a drug addict more drugs. <laughs> nowhere, yeah. nowhere in the entire canine species is food used as a communication tool, much okay. less a fee it. So why are we trying to force a dog to comply to our human expectations when right. cells don't do that? It's, a, it's, it's psychological behavior. So that's my mandate is to share what I've done. Um, and you know, if you're, you, you can ask somebody who's got maybe some experience with an average dangerous dog. Right. You want to find out the, the, the aspects of truth and the, uh, the, the, the actual application of theory in real life with someone like me who has really been working with the dogs, <laughs> working with dogs that are extremely frightening wow. and tutorial dogs. So my experience has taught me to read these dogs that speed and from that I understand why a dog blinks, I understand why a dog's hackles go up in the front and back, I know why a dog licks the front, left and uh, uh, side of their faces, uh, the tail behavior, all these aspects of behavior on it. So that's my mandate of my rescue foundation to share it. So at the beginning of the podcast, we made, we named like some, some uh, 1400 days. So how many years have you been working with these uh, dangerous dogs at this point? Uh, about three and a half years. Only? Okay, you really just have a knack. Because <laughs> you would think like you have experience of 25 years, but for you it's just you have an intuition and you feed on that intuition and you see what works and what doesn't work and you've built like a process, I guess, from it. But, um, yeah. you know, we need to get you in everywhere. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm extremely gifted. Uh, I've never turned down a dog. I've never killed a dog. I never recommended a dog to be killed. I'm able to evaluate a dog within under one minute. It used to take me an hour and 20 minutes, three and a half years ago. Now it takes me under a minute. My accuracy is 100%. And, um, you know, that part is if I went through traditional, uh, if I went through traditional training, yeah. I would be taught to be afraid of the dogs again. Yes, you know, that's right, because they, it's fear-based, like, you know, people think you have to dominate or overpower the dog, and I, I guess you've proven that that's not the case, right? So. I mean, at the end of the day, if you're having trouble, you're not going to phone the person up who's going to give you heck and treat you like garbage. Right. You're going to phone the person who's going to make you feel better about yourself in a, in a, in a positive way, not yeah. patronizing, and make you feel safe. And that's what the dog wants, because the dog... Just to feel safe, yeah. Yeah. 
and, and the, the dynamics between the dog and the human is that the dog is an overt codependent and the human is a covert codependent, which allows our sympathetical to occur where we have that somewhat question of why do dogs and humans get along for 10,000 years? Yeah. It's, because the, the, it's because of the codependency aspects of it, what I call the emotional isomorphism of the genetics between the two of us, and then we start to learn about each other. Wow, that sounded really sophisticated, what you said. <laughs> I, I caught some of those words, but I, essentially we balance each other out, I guess? Yes, exactly. Yeah. We balance each other. Yin and yang. Yeah. There excellent. you go. Yin and yang. But a dog, so. uh, a dog is man's best friend, after all, and that's what, I guess, made it so um, devastating for me to see how they're treated in some parts of the world. But, you know, we cannot forget that there's so much animal cruelty everywhere. There's puppy mills and there's like uh, those dogs, you know, um, in the north, they're horribly yeah. abused, they're chained up to, you know, like a post and, you know, there's, there's animal cruelty everywhere, but I guess we can't fix the whole world in, in one single effort, so I guess you have to um, grapple over the most extreme cases of animal abuse, and for me, I think the dog cat me trade is just... The fact that it's intentional cruelty, the fact that it's deliberate, that makes it really, you know, beyond acceptable. So it, it has to change. And like you said, I guess um, it's going to be a question of um, validating the work of the good organizations that are doing respectable work and actually working uh, the education aspect, the legislative aspects. And there are some good organizations. So I guess. Maybe the point of this podcast is going to be highlighting some of that work, you know, some, you know, because a lot of them, they're under the radar because they don't have the funding. And so it's going to be good to shine a spotlight on, on those very people. And I think you're a good resource uh, for that. So I'm going to definitely hit you up for some names. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, Animal Home Wellness had me do some video online consults when they were in China. Oh. So, so oh. all these parts... It, 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 it's, it's really the fact that if we can change society's perception of dogs as not being material, and that they are truly emotionally and cognitively based that they think, yeah. and if we can convince society, even here in, in our democratic society, if we can convince us that that's the truth, yeah. they, they have feelings, then we can make that adjustment forward. But of course, you've got the meat industry that um, has a certain perspective and it's financially motivated always. I mean, I mean, how can you go to McDonald's and buy a hamburger for a buck? Like, really, that's, that's just it's subsidized, horrible. yeah, subsidized, yeah, that's it. Um, well, on that point, I guess uh, I would like to end a little bit on an emotional note. I don't know if you're willing to talk about it, but we talked about Nero, your dog, and you unfortunately lost him this year in June. And can you tell us a little bit more about his story? I know you told us you adopted him, I think, in 2005? No, in 2016? Yes. Um, so what happened is my, my first game, Lincoln, he died of severe respiratory distress on January 16th. And right off the bat, I thought I was never going to get another dog again. And then I realized that that's a selfish aspect of my end because Lincoln would have loved it for his life to be replaced with a new life that needed help. So I started looking for another dog, and I went to look for an aggressive, if not dangerous dog. And so I started. <laughs> you have uh, quite the dog in the back of you. <laughs> That's William as well. He, he's dog reactive. Um, um, so what ended up happening is I, I looked for specifically for a dog that was reactive, dangerous, uh, had to have at least a significant bite history, and uh, I preferred an older dog as well because everybody one can take a puppy, a young dog, and know. you know. Everybody the work because they have five, six, ten years. So then I found Nero, and he was at that time around ten, just about ten years of age. And so uh, I said that I was interested. Mickey, I was, so I said I was interested in uh, adopting him. And the uh, rescue organization, which is Save Rocky, the Great Dane Rescue and Rehab, largest Great Dane Rescue in North America, um, said, "Well, you know, this is what this is what he's like, and this is his issues." And then I said, "Well, let me give you some thoughts of what he's like." And I told them, and I did an evaluation on him, and they said. And they said, uh, who told you about him? And I said, no, I just read his pictures and all that said. And they went, no, no, so who, who, like, who have you been talking to? And I said, no one. I just, I, I read his wow. pictures and description. And they said, okay, well, we believe you. Um, and then, 
I guess, and they, yeah. Yeah, and then they asked other people who were in the Great Dane community, and then these people all confirmed that what I said I could do, I did, like, especially with Elaine Dixon. Um, and then uh, I had already heard that Nero had grabbed that woman off the couch and caused 67 stitches. I saw the injury. And, and these are, this is a specifically gross looking injury uh, and, and, and huge. And, um, you know, I knew these things. And I knew about him uh, trying to pull people over the fence and I knew he was male reactive. And I knew he couldn't be touched below the neck. And I said, just send him to me. And they said, you know, he's dangerous. He, he may try to kill you. And I said, yeah, I know, just send him to me. So Nero came to me, um, at, you know, because I'm just going to deal with him. So Nero came to me at 10 years, four months of age. Uh, there were some very significant interactions between him and I, and uh, he was uh, 140 pounds. He, he, he was actually at a kill shelter. He'd spent seven years um, caged as a breeding dog, and uh, three years outside with a prong collar, which is another reason why I hate prong collars, uh, on a chain, three, uh, three years in Alabama. Uh, weighed 75 pounds at the kill shelter at 10 years of age, he's going to die anyways. So when he came to me, got him up to 140 pounds. Mickey, stop please. Um, got him up to 140 pounds, and uh, you couldn't touch him below the neckline. Uh, a lot of things that were happening were quite dangerous. Um, a, a number of confrontations with me. I have a couple on video that people have remarked is uh, unbelievably um, uh, dangerous. Yeah. Um, so then I just started working with Nero, and it took me about a month to have him integrated. And he had significant prey drive. He was also an impact male. And, uh, you know, you're dealing with a 10-year-old Great Dane that's uh, got a history already of, of attacking people. Um, and I just worked with him, and I worked with him. And I thought Nero would live three to six months of age. And I thought, okay, you know what? I, I couldn't want to get attached to a dog because of losing Lincoln. And so I had Nero with me. And, you know, lo and behold, he lived three and a half years with me to 13 years and seven months, right? Wow. Um, so I had him on CBD oil from Hemp My Pet, which is the one that I oh. found out of. And I, heard, worked on I heard about CBD and it's it's really amazing, the uh, the benefits for anxiety. You get, and, yeah. yeah, you got to get the organic stuff and don't buy the stuff that comes in from China because it's a lower grade. So you go with yeah, the mess. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Early back. And they can repackage it here. In North America, and call it made in you know Canada, made in the United States. It can refine it here, and and, and oh, they even look. Oh, okay, so it doesn't look like it comes from China. Yeah. So when you they ask, where is your actual source of supply for the CBD oil? Um, the other things I had with Nero is I uh, once he started faltering and quivering on the back end, I reduced his weight. I wouldn't let him run anymore. I would help him downstairs. I would help him up and out of my vehicle. Um, you know, a lot of things. You saw pictures of me. He's in a. He's you know in a little wagon that I'm carrying him around. Yeah. Uh, towards the last few months, I was doing his urine cap. Um, I was expressing his bladder so he could pee. Um, you know, my, my beloved Lincoln, I was doing the same thing. I was doing urine catheters for him. Uh, I was also manually helping Nero defecate as well. Yeah. So a lot That's of this. You have to deal with, with senior animals, but, you know, I mean, that's a small price to pay, I guess, for the relationship that you build, yeah. We would do the same for a human being, so. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so, um, I guess I was hoping, I, I don't know if I can go through it, but um, you wrote something really, really beautiful on your website. And um, I'm going to give it a shot because I'm very, very sensitive, but I'll try to, to do it justice. So you wrote in memory of Nero, Psy. Uh, you wrote, run like the wind across the bridge over the rainbow forever in our hearts. Born December 5th, 2005, rescued March 3rd, 2016, died June 11th, 2019 at 11.54 a.m. Three years, four months of incredible love unconditionally shared. So that is beautiful. And there's a whole eulogy actually on your website. And I invite everyone at home to go check out your website. It's Arf, Arf Bark Bark uh, Foundation. Uh, our park, our park, com. Dot com, exactly. So go check it out because it's extremely touching. I, I was crying like when I read it. I was like, oh, because I it's a bond that you form with an animal that is on. There's no words for it. Like it's really it transcends anything that you could form with a human. I find it's so much stronger. I think in part because animals are so pure. Yeah. 
and they love unconditionally. When they give you their heart, there's no condition, there's no agenda, it's just pure. And, you know, I mean, we need more of that going around and less cruelty, <laughs> much more love. And, you know, animals are here to teach us, I feel. Uh, they're the greatest teachers. In my case, my cats really helped me uh, deal with some aggressive, aggression. I was very, um, very aggressive. Um, I had, you know, past issues. And uh, the minute I had a cat, I could not argue with my husband. Yeah. I just, I, you know, they feel energy, like it's incredible. And so I stopped arguing with my husband. I, if we would have a disagreement, we'd just go walk away and cool off and then talk like adults. And so it helped me tremendously. And I think the the biggest treasures the world has to offer us and it's our duty to protect them and respect them and honor them. So I think you feel the same way. <laughs> Um, you know, one of the things that I want to work on one of these days is uh, developing a, um, a, a process to say goodbye to our beloved dogs and cats. And that's that process of how do we prepare versus the bucket list aspect of it, but how do we prepare ourselves so that the day when our dog does die, our own emotions doesn't affect our dog's feelings because then they're going to see us upset, crying. So I've already got this, uh, this process of how I would step this guideline to do so which um i've mentioned a couple of people and they're like you know it's just like that the the un thing right yeah that, that's you know it's simplistic and it's brilliant in what it is um the other thing like with nero is well that photo of him um with the sun behind him you know a few months beforehand is when it was taken and knowing that nero was going to die i looked i, I looked <laughs> i feel like uh, petting him <laughs> Um, I started looking for photos that I want to use as tribute to Nero um, to use when he died. And so that's, um, William, stop, please. And so that's that's something that I would encourage anybody. Oh, to prepare ahead of time. Yeah, because you knew he, he, he was very sick and he was going to pass away. And so to prepare ahead of time to take uh, the, the time to appreciate them and those moments. And that one photo that you know is that photo in your head when you're taking it is this is the photo I'm going to use when my my Nero my dog dies. Yeah, I think that's really important. I think that's a good idea. <laughs> well, there's no easy way to say goodbye to your animal, but you know there's certainly, like you said, a process that we could uh, try to encourage others to adopt. So at this point, I think we're going to let you get on with your evening and your little fellows over there. <laughs> So do you want to introduce them to the camera, even though, like, they're... <laughs> who's Anthony. this little guy? Anthony's up for adoption. Yeah, Anthony. he's the one who's 18 months old, 160 pounds, and so he's looking for... He's extremely, extremely, extremely affectionate. Yeah, Just... I can tell. <laughs> and what kind yeah. of dog is it? It's a great name? Yes, he's a great name. Uh, the other one was William that came up to me, the, the fawn colored, the lighter yes. colored name. So he's from Mexico. He was going to be killed for dog reactivity. So you can see him with five or four other dogs. Um, and then right here below, you can't see his little Minky from Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation. Oh, okay. We can't see him. He's like a small yeah. little dog. Little, little white Jindo. Minky, Minky, come. Stop, stop, Minky. Hi, silly boy. Hi, silly boy. Hello, Minky. Oh, my God. Hi, silly boy. Uh, out of, out of 20,000 plus dogs that Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation had gone through their rescue, he's the one dog they couldn't help. And so they reached out to me and said, could you please help them? So I'm the person, only trainer they've ever had work with any of their dogs outside of their, their facility. Wow. Uh, so he, he was extremely reactive, fighting people, um, a lot of issues and so forth, and dog reactive, etc. cetera. Uh, none of their staff can uh, touch him. So he's here. And then I have, uh, I'll grab, uh, um, I have Lincoln, but he's, he's gone to the bedroom. And he's, an, he's another great name that's, that I personally adopted. And I'll bring Sam. Sam, okay. Hey. This is Sammy. Oh, Sammy. What Sammy kind of dog is that? Uh, she's a Promotion Mountain dog from Taiwan. Oh, yeah. No, you see a lot of those dogs in Asia. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I adopted her because she only has two legs. Oh, poor little girl. Yeah, so she was hit by a car. She used to be uh, with the family because she was found with a founder. Um, her injuries were uh, extremely graphic, and so she was saved by a different rescue in Taiwan. Uh, so I adopted her a month after after Nero. Wow. 
And how she's, did she get, do you have a little wheelchair for her to get around or? I do have a wheelchair even though it's a little bit decrepit right now, so I need to get, try to save up for a new one. Um, but she does walk on her front wall. Oh, so yeah, dogs are inc incredibly resilient and it's amazing. They can pretty much live a very successful life without one of their limbs. And, and yeah. in her case too. And and yeah, she's she never, a cutie, oh my gosh, she's so cute. Uh, She's so though she's staring at you. Right? She is really cute. And she was trying to give you kisses earlier. <laughs> Very affectionate. Yeah, so she's adorable. So, I mean, I, I've always got that uh, thing out for dogs with, you know, challenges, right? So, of course. Dogs with disabilities or any animal with a disability. It's always makes you feel like... <laughs> oh, no, I think I see Mickey. I think uh, the little white tail. Yeah, the little white tail. And what was her story? Did she come from Asia? Uh, yeah, he, uh, Miki, he was born in a meat dog farm, so he was in a cage. Oh, um, South Korea. South Korea? Uh, yeah, South Korea. Um, yeah, and his videos are on my YouTube channel. And he came to, he went through uh, Korea through uh, one of the rescues out there. Then he was brought to Los Angeles to Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation. And then they had him for a number of months, and nobody could work with him. He was too reactive. He wouldn't take treats, etc. And he was biting people unpredictably. He couldn't be walked outside. The staff wasn't able to uh, get close to him other than one person was able to walk him. And that was barely uh, uh, tolerable for him. Um, so they weren't able to have any, any part of uh, a progress with him. Um, they had tried other trainers. They, they've got a well-known trainer on their board of directors. Uh, nobody was able to progress him. And so they said, hey, we've seen your work. We know you. Would you mind helping? And I said, yeah, yeah okay. And, and then, uh, how long has uh, Mickey been with you at this point? Uh, he's been with me for over a year now. So uh, Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation um, is supposed to be sharing his uh, post to have him adopted. So I'm hoping that I'll get them to be able to do that sooner. Because at um, this point, he's rehabilitated, of course. <laughs> you need integration with people, of course. I mean, there's always that, that change, just like you or I. We were to, you know, move from one house to another house with a bunch of people, and there we have to start to right. people. So um, I'm always cognizant of that part where if there's going to be an adoption or transition that the people themselves know that there are going to be issues that there's have to be. It's an adjustment. Uh, it's an adjustment period. It's natural. Yeah. But uh, how long did it take you to get him to a point where he was less reactive and he was starting to be a little bit more social? Thirty-six hours. <laughs> Unbelievable! No one yeah. could could train him, and you, like, yeah, two days, I, I, that's it. I read the I, like I say as I read the psychogenetic markers on the dog at two tenths of a second. My accuracy is one hundred percent, so I knew exactly what was wrong with him. And I said to them, uh, to Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation, I said, you know, this is his issues. I can just tell you guys over the phone how to do, or I, you, I can bring you down. You know, you could bring me down, etc. And they were like, no, he's too much, and we don't have the staff to be able to dedicate to him, but wow. we need to come out. And their experienced fosters weren't able to take him because of the, uh, the danger. Um, and so I came up here, and the videos you'll see, the, there's four videos in the playlist, and the first one is literally over 36 hours, and I maintained live uh, video uh, updates to, to his rescue, so I sent them to his rescue so they knew what wow. was happening. Wow, um, that's amazing. I really am. I'm so glad it, I discovered you, <laughs> and everyone should benefit from discovering you. So uh, we'll definitely post uh, all the links up, and uh, people can take a look for themselves. And at this point, I'm going to thank you for your time. You've been extremely generous. We've been talking for almost like two hours. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much. And definitely, I will be in touch with you because you're a great resource of information. And I want this podcast to have the impact. I want it to be positive. I want it to help animals and not just be there for entertainment. Uh, I want people to be inspired. And hopefully, together, we'll do some good work. <laughs> yeah, we're all in it separately and together. Yeah, Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, well, bye-bye. Is that Sammy? Yeah, yeah, this is still... Okay, so have a good night, Sammy. <laughs> for me, it's nighttime. For you, it's, um, what is it, 6 o'clock? It's dinner time. <laughs> so, but thank you so much as well, Jade. And I mean, uh, you know, uh, just really appreciate um, your time as well. Oh, well, you're more than welcome. And I'll let you know when this is going to...